All right, so you just finished your speech. Yes, I did. Roots. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank People you. People were really fired up. People were amazing. Were so great. It was so, so good. Yeah. I feel like there was great energy. You helped bring it out and everyone. Yes. So yes. thank you for coming out. You spoke about electing better Democrats. Yes. And I was thinking about what can Democrats do to get like young voters of color engaged, right? We hear a lot about Democrats who want to keep reaching out for like the white voters who are just a very low chance of being, you know. Right. So how, how do we kind of shift? What do you think Democrats should be doing so we can get the better Democrats and, you know, get them Well, engaged? I mean, so I think we have to do a lot of things. One of the things is I think we have to meet voters where they are and speak to their issues, mm -hmm. you know? And I think this is a trap that so many long-term politicians have fallen into because of the burden of fundraising, right? And because how much corporate money there is out there to be gotten and how, how campaigning is just big business. Yeah. Um, but what we need is more people like myself, like Alexandria, who are running, who are not accepting corporate donations, but are really speaking about com foundational change, mm -hmm. right? Foundational change. Whether you're talking about the need for single payer, the need for 100% transition to renewable energy, you're talking about police accountability, ending mass incarceration. Um, so speaking to people about the issues and knowing that they're people running and, yeah. and the electeds really are aware of these issues and know how important they are and know what a crisis we're in. But I think also, obviously, we just need more diverse people running for office. And, and I think enacting campaign finance reform is such an important part of that. And I think it has to be a rallying cry of the Democratic Party because so many of our candidates and our electeds are white, wealthy men who have access to networks of cash, which enables them to run. And we want a more, a more diverse electorate. And we want, it, we want it for a lot of reasons, but we also, you know, younger people, people who are not in office, people of color, immigrants, queer people, women. Um, we bring such a, such a breath of fresh air to what's needed and to, so, you know, so many of our electeds are really frankly part of the problem. And I think they can't see the forest for the trees. And they think in terms of incremental change, we need, we need to turn the system upside down. I agree. I love that. Yeah, in terms of like turning over the system, I remember your video about um, marijuana and, yeah. and racism and yeah. that like it was amazing to see a white candidate talk about it and not, not skirt it and be like, this is an issue. And yeah. so how did you get involved? Like, I didn't know you were this woke, basically, <laughs> is what I'm saying. So how did this happen? <laughs> well, I think that, you know, frankly, with Donald Trump in the White House, uh, the stakes are higher than they've ever been in my lifetime, and I have to say, the the, the racism, the xenophobia, the misogyny, the homophobia, all of these things that we always knew were really important strains running through American society, what Donald Trump's election has done has just taken the log, picked it up, turned it over, and we can see we can see all the stuff that's happening that's that's finally being exposed. Yeah. Um, and, and frankly, <laughs> there, there, are not, there are not a lot of upsides to Donald Trump's election, but I think the, the way in which he's exposed um, how, how, how deeply racist the, 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 the society is, and he's been a real, has, as you say, people have woken up. Mm -hmm. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement has been so important in terms of talking about police accountability and talking about how many people of color are dying at the hands of the police in police custody. But I think also technology has been so important. You know, people with their iPhones, either people who are involved in these interactions with the police or people who are standing by, it's made all the difference because you can hear about a statistic or you can even read about somebody in the paper. But when you're there, front and center, as it's happening, it gives you, a, as a white person, it gives you a window into what what life is like in America that most of the time you just don't get to see. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I also heard you, you speak a lot about schools and mm -hmm. like schools not jails and the yeah. school to prison pipeline. So 
what would you do? Like, what are what would you what would you do to address that if you became governor of New York? So, like school funding in particular, mm -hmm. and how unequally our schools are funded in New York State is something I've been fighting on for 17 years since my oldest child entered kindergarten. I have three kids, and the oldest is 21, and he entered kindergarten 17 years ago. Uh, and I started fighting, you know, budget cuts on the city level, but very quickly I learned that there was actually a statewide solution, a, a lawsuit mm -hmm. that was brought on behalf of the children of New York. Um, saying that they were having their constitutional rights violated because so little was being spent in so many districts they couldn't possibly get a sound basic education that they were guaranteed in the New York Constitution. Mm -hmm. So this is like our generation's Brown versus the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And it was the highest court in New York said you have to put in this money, you have to put in 5.4 billion mostly to high needs low income school districts. And we had a governor, Governor Spitzer, who was enacting this. We were halfway there, and then Governor Cuomo came into office, and it just stalled, and it all the money was cut out, and then and then more deeply. So our kids are still owed 4.2 billion. So that's a really important place to start because our our. our our schools are the second most unequally funded. The top 100 school districts in New York spend 10,000 more per pupil than the bottom 100 school districts. Just think about that, 10,000 per pupil. So in a school of 500 kids, that's a $5 million difference. In a school of 1,000 kids, that's a $10 million difference. And a lot of that has to do with systemic racism, without a doubt. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, I love how this is seems to be very different career choice, right? Yeah, and yeah. I'm really interested just because I'm curious. How has your path, like your acting career, been helpful uh, running? Well, or, or it's, has, or has well, it's it been? been helpful okay. in terms of people know who oh. I am. Right, that's, <laughs> right. that's a real help. Um, and when I was fighting for issues like school funding or LGBTQ equality or women's rights or abortion rights, um, it was really helpful because people were more, you know, the press would cover it essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also. Um, you know, I'm used to interacting with people. It's a big part of my, it's a big part of my profession. Mm -hmm. um, it's very different the way I actually like interacting with people as a candidate more than as an actor really? because yeah, because people just react to you in a more genuine way that has to do more with them than with you. Mm -hmm. So they actually are are much more eager to tell you stuff about their lives and what's what's wrong and what they want changed and. And, and how they see New York. So that's, you know, it's not just, oh, I love, you know, I loved you on your show, but actually a really much more meaningful conversation, which I think is always much better. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I've taken up enough of your time, so yeah. thank you thank so you. much for speaking with thank me. You. Yeah.